handle the truth. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome back to another Saturday night. Cell block. And tonight is a very special night, man. But before we get into that, let me give my graces and my blessings um, to everybody out there. I hope that everybody is safe and sound. Um, I know it's snowing already up in some parts up north, so I hope you guys are keeping warm. And um, <clears throat> and just many blessings to those that are, are less fortunate enough to be able to stay warm. The, the holiday seasons are coming up. It's getting cold. And with that, please, um, if you can, uh, donate. Cominghomecoalition.com. Please go there. Uh, what, what we're looking for now, what, what you guys can help out with, is um, those blankets. You can go on there like a dollar and a half. If the next time you're out, those metallic looking NASA space suits, I'm going to get a link to them and put them up in the description. And um, I'll be passing that out as well because we are collecting those and passing those out to the homeless as well. They can fold up. They can put them right in their backpack and it keeps them insulated and warm. So we will be passing those out. With that being said, welcome, welcome. Tonight is, is, a, is, is a big night for me because this has been on my mind for a long time. People have been asking me, when are you going to talk about your case? When are you going to talk about your federal indictment and, and what went on with that? <clears throat> and people have to understand this is triggering for me, right? Because I still hold a lot of... of uh, animosity. I want to make sure I choose the right word. I still hold a lot of animosity for a lot of things, but it's also accepting to know that I was the result of all of this. I created all of this in my decision making and my thought process, which is paramount to why I do what I do, because I feel like I'm quote unquote man enough to to express how I felt and what was going on in my life at that time for parents who may have children that are going through the same thing. Um, they may see residuals, they may see uh, effects, things of that nature, and maybe uh, they'll know how to attack their children a little differently. Um, just, just today, I, I saw uh, a post on Facebook of this mother who said that her child ran away again for like the 14th time already. She didn't know where he was at, and he just got caught in school with a vape pen. And she didn't know what to do. And, and some of the comments were, you know, call the police and send him the juvenile and things like that. So, you know, I stepped in and I just asked if she would like to see if her son would like to be part of the show. Maybe come on and, and I'll talk to him, see what's going on. So this is always available for parents. You can reach out to me on Facebook. You can reach out to me on, on Snapchat. Just Google Thomas Free Me. If you have a problem with your child and you just you, you don't know what to do, just reach out to me. Email me, Coming Home Coalition, uh, chc at cominghomecoalition.com, and, and we'll you know see if he'll come on, she'll come on, and we'll talk and see really what's going on. So with that being said, let's get on to it, right? So I'm going to share some pictures with you. This was Macho. This was my dog. This was, uh, this was my buddy. And this was me. When I had Macho, we were staying in this little apartment right here. And this was my car, man. This was my 1967 Chevrolet Impala. And there goes your boy driving. This was a time where, the, you know, this guy here was, uh, he was lost. And where he was lost at, he was, he was really just trying to earn respect. Find his place for him to fit in and, and mold in and, and grow from there. But he just... He could not find the respect that he was looking for, no matter how he tried. 
uh, he was bullied a lot, ridiculed a lot, made fun of a lot. And he just found a crowd, you know, he just found a crowd of, of like minded people who just couldn't fit in anywhere. And as I've said in prior episodes, this was a town that was the influx of, of minorities and poor people into this town because Tampa Bay was growing so fast and, and everything was expanding out. This town was not prepared for this influx. There was nothing to do, nowhere to go. This was a retirement community, you know? And um, it was just houses, houses and houses and houses. There was nothing for teenagers to do. We were, we were trolling the streets looking for things to do. And every time a game room opened up, you know, there'd be thousands of kids that would, you know, flock to just this one game room. And the next thing you know, they would end up shutting the game room down and the police would always be there. So this was the type of community that we lived in, that we were trying to grow up in. And there were problems. We were problem kids. And I just found my crowd, you know, and, and uh, this crowd happened to be into dealing drugs and making money any any kind of way that we could. Now, this was mid-90s, you know, mid-90s coming up. Uh, ecstasy was big. And we would just do whatever we did to make money all weekend to really just to, to party. You know, we'd make money all week to make money to party on the weekend is what I'm trying to say. We would hustle and grind all week for the weekend. And then we would blow all that on the weekend, you know, but we had parties. We'd rent limousines. We'd rent VIP rooms and have bottles of champagne and we'd travel and we would do all these things. And we were just a group of kids that all grew up together and we were selling drugs, whatever drugs we could get. Some, some of the particular uh, individuals became bigger. They started selling more, more drugs. And, and this was a, a little bit of a younger crowd. The crowd that I was running with was, was, was one generation older. And then this next generation that was coming up wanted bigger and more. We were just hustling to, to party and have fun and to survive. You know, that's all my intention ever was, was just to pay the bills and, and, and have a roof over my head until I could figure my life out because I didn't know what to do. By this time, I was already a convicted felon. I had already went to state prison. You know, I've, I've been in juvenile detention center since I was 14, 15 years old, you know, in and out. And, and then as soon as I graduated into adulthood, I just started going to jail for little petty stuff, in and out, in and out. And then ultimately, I ended up going to state prison. So I was already a convicted felon. I'm 25 years old, and we're in this neighborhood where everybody kind of knows each other, but we were already labeled as trouble kids. Wherever we went, you know, people would just look at us as trouble kids. So we were marked already. So I knew nothing else but to sell drugs. I didn't know any other way to, to eat, you know, and I'm, I'm coming into age now. I'm 20, 21, 22. I've been a free spirit ever since I was a kid. And the first chance that I could get out of my parents' house, I was gone. You know, I dropped out of school and, and I was gone from there. I hardly came home anymore. And from that point, I'm just, I'm just dealing drugs. I, my particular drug was cocaine. I sold cocaine and I sold crack cocaine. I stayed away from heroin because I, I just did not want that type of clientele. It's a whole different type of clientele. And I really didn't particularly like dealing with the crack, but the money on the flip was so good, you couldn't really deny it. So this is essentially all it really was. Now, this younger generation was pushing so much cocaine and they were doing all their partying in the same town. There was a, a small little club called uh, Club Manhattan. And these guys would go in the Club Manhattan and they would blow thousands and thousands of dollars in this broke little club, you know? So... I never had nothing to do with that younger generation. You know, they were, they were running around with their pants down and they were just acting like something that they weren't, right? Like we weren't trying to be gangbangers or, or anything like that. We were just dope boys. That's all we were. We were just dope boys. We were just kids who would just hang out, smoke weed, you know, get into trouble here or there. We'd, you know, whatever. We were just little dope boys. 
But these, this younger generation that came up was ruining everything that we had going on. I stayed away from all of them and I, and I did my own thing. I stayed to myself. So much as so as the own crew that I used to run with, I, I departed with all of them. Because now I'm starting to fall into a relationship with my baby mother. And really, I'm, I'm starting to paint this picture of, of this, this fantasy life in my mind. You know, that I can be a, a family man. And, you know, and I guess a lot of that depicted from the movies that were coming out at that time. You know, I would see Goodfellas and I would see The Sopranos and I would see these and I would see these mafioso type individuals that had this secret dark crime life but yet still uphold a moral family code. And I guess I saw myself kind of in that, you know, and, and I guess in a way I was trying to replicate that. And what ended up happening was an individual that got very close to me at the time by the name of, of Freddie, right? Freddie um, got very close to me to the point to where we we were associating with each other every day like this was my, my my partner when i got up in the morning yo fred what's up what's going on man what's what's up for the day we click up we smoke weed and we'd be together all day every day and we were hustling together and at the time his father was a was a large cocaine dealer who had got busted years earlier and was doing a federal bid at Coleman. Now, the guy that Freddie was dealing with down south was uh, just screwing him over. And they both spoke Spanish. I didn't know Spanish, right? And, and he was just robbing this dude. He was robbing us. You know, it was our money. And every time it come back, it was just more and more and more stepped on. So at this point, I'm telling dude, like, listen, man. Like, we have to cut him off and do something else because this is, this is killing us. At this time, Freddie makes the suggestion that I go to, you know, uh, uh, my homeboy who's doing all the big stuff and talk to him. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that because those dudes, I don't mess with those dudes. Those dudes are hot. I know they're hot and I don't want nothing to do with them. You know, we got to figure out another way. So what ended up happening was he cut off from them and we started looking for somebody else. And at that time, really, there was a, a severe drought. So it came up about 2002 Christmas time and Freddie comes to me and he's like, listen, man, just set it up with dude and I'll go meet him pick it up, come back, and we'll go from there. So I was tired of him asking me. I knew he would, he done spent all his money. He was broke. He came to me with this little sob story. So again, I broke, and I did it for him. And set it up, went to the mall. Freddie got out of the car. He went and met Mikey. Mikey gave him the brick of cocaine. They came back in. He got in. We went back to the house, opened it up, and it was gas. You know, it was it was straight fire. So we ended up dealing with him about three or four more times after that. Now, Mikey comes to my house one night about 12 o'clock. When Mikey comes to my house, right, and sits down, he's like, man, I got a problem. So I'm like, what's, you know, what's going on? So he's like, there's this dude named Joe that I deal with. Joe got arrested, right? And Joe's out. And I don't know what's going on with that. So I said, well, elaborate. Tell me what's going on. So he tells me that Joe lives in a trailer that's rented. And he had got into an argument with his girl. And during this argument, she had called the police and told the police that her boyfriend was a drug dealer. So now when the police come, right, Joe meets them outside they search his car. Now, upon searching his car, they find an eight ball of cocaine. Now, that gives them probable cause to go in the house. Now, upon going inside the house, they find a kilo and some, some crack and things like that. So, Joe goes to jail. Joe gets out on a Sunday. 
Joe gets out on a Sunday and gives Mikey the story that he did not get arrested for the kilo. He only got arrested for the eight ball. The reason why he did not get arrested for the kilo was because the trailer was not in his name. He was renting the trailer and they could not pin, they could not, the police could not figure out who the kilo belonged to. They couldn't pin it on Joe because it's not his trailer. The kilo was in the trailer and the owner is saying he don't live there. So they don't know who the kilos was. So he only got arrested for the eight ball. Now I'm looking at Mikey like, you know what I'm saying? Mike, like you, you know, <laughs> you're not buying none of that, right? Like this dude is, there's, there's no way. First off, listen, there is no way that cops are going to find a kilo of cocaine and not arrest nobody for it. Somebody's going to jail for it. I promise you in this town at, at, at that, these cops, like who's going to let that go? These people get promoted off that. So first and foremost, somebody got arrested for that kilo. Next, you can't get out. Like if you got arrested on a Saturday, you don't get out on a Sunday because you still got to go in front of a, je a judge. You still got to get bail, all of these things. It don't happen instantaneous like that. So this dude is out. And I told Mike and I said, furthermore, if you deal with this dude, I said, I'm not dealing with you no more. So he gave me his word, man. I give you my word. I give you my word. You know, I'm not dealing with this cat. But he's like, man, but he owes me for that. And I'm like, man, listen, I, listen, let that go. That's gone, right? Catch that on the backside or something, but don't even worry about that right now. This dude gave me his word. So now, about two months later after this, right, I'm laying low. I'm staying to myself. I'm doing my little thing, just, just my little clients that I had that were, you know, were weekly, were good people, whatever. And, and I would just go see them and, and such. And what ended up happening was the Chevrolet Impala that you saw in that picture was at a body shop. I was getting the interior done. My homeboy just got out of, my homeboy just got out of prison himself like maybe two weeks earlier. And I wanted to show him the Chevy that I was getting done and such. So I tell him, listen, come with me, take a ride with me. Let's go look at the Chevy. Let me show you what's getting done. Now, mind you, if we get pulled over, I have no tags. You know, that's the reason why, but my license is good. So don't worry about it. So he's like, man, I'm not worried about it. So we, we get in the car, we go. Now, I get in the, the Chevy, and as we start driving down the road, I get pulled over. Now, when I get pulled over, right, I tell Augie, I say, man, don't worry about it. It's good. You know, my license is good, this and that. The cop comes up to the window. He says, may I see your license and registration? Sure, here you go. And I told him, uh, he says, you know why I pulled you over? And I said, well, yes, sir. I don't have a tag on the, on the car. He said, how come you don't have a tag? I said, because I got it down at the body shop. I'm getting the interior done. He said that he needed, I needed to put gas in it. This, the body shop set me up is what they did. But I don't know this at the time. But the body shop said that I needed to put gas in the car. And here I go. So he's like, okay, cool. Let me go check it out. So now the cop comes back and he asks me to step out of the car. So I'm like, step out of the car for what? So he's like, step out of the car and I'll, and I'll let you know. So when I get out of the car, I'm leaning up against the back of the car. and he says, well, there's a warrant for your arrest. I said, a warrant for my arrest for what? He said, well, there's a warrant in Virginia for sales and possession of cocaine. I said, Virginia? I said, no. I said, that's not me. I said, matter of fact, I said, you can go ahead and take me downtown now. We'll handle it down there. I said, because I know that's not something we can handle on the side of the road. So he's like, no, hold on. Let me go see what's going on. So he's like, you, you've never been. I said, I've never been to Virginia, let alone taking some cocaine to Virginia. So he's like, okay, let me go see. So he's like, well, but in the meantime, I got to put you in the back of the cop car. So bam, they cuffed me, put me in the back of the cop car. Now I'm in the back of this car. And I, I swear to you, about 20 cop cars pulled up, press vans, people all over the place, people in suits. There were so many people around, I couldn't even see them all. Right. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? I have no idea what's going on. 
So now this cop comes and he opens the cop door. He's on the phone. He opens the door and he lifts my leg because I have a scar on my leg. And he lifts my shirt because I have a tattoo. And he identified me to whoever he was talking to on the phone. Then he shuts the door. So now I'm back in the cop car again for about 45 minutes. They got my poor homeboy up, questioning him all kinds of stuff. He looks like a nervous wreck, you know. So sooner or later, the cop comes, he opens the door again, asks me for my social. I give it to him. He shuts it. About another 30 minutes go by. People start dispersing. Everybody starts leaving. Everybody leaves. He comes and he opens and he opens the, the door. And he's like, at this point. I've already put it in my mind I'm going to jail. I'm like, I don't know what the hell is going on, but I'm going to jail. I'm thinking about everything I got in my house, where everything is at. I'm going through A to Z in my head, right? He opens the cop door and he's like, all right, you're free to go. What do you mean I'm free to go? What does that mean? He's like, you're free to go. He said, just be mindful that there is an individual out there with your same exact name, different social security number. That's who we're looking for. Okay. Now, I may have bought that, but he identified me. If he didn't identify my markings, I might have bought that. I still would have been cautious. I might have bought it. But I knew that this was a lie. So I'm like, okay, cool. You know, whatever. He leaves. I get back in the car. <laughs> my homeboy looks at me. He's like, well, what the fuck was that about? And I said, man, listen. Homeboy, the only thing that makes sense is they have me under investigation and they just messed up. This cop wasn't supposed to pull me over. At the time, that's what I'm thinking. But now I know, of course, after trial, these people had no idea who I was. They didn't know where I lived at. They knew nothing about me. They just kept hearing my name coming up from different people here and there because of this dude that was working with them. Right. But they had no idea who I was. None, not a clue. They had to find out where I lived at. This is what they do. They'll pull you over and run this little scheme, this little banana jana thing, you know what I'm saying? To find out who you are, where you live at. So I tell them, I say, man, listen, the only thing that makes sense is they got me under investigation and they just messed up. He's like, man, that's what it is. So I, I called my baby mom at the time. I asked where she was at. I told her to go straight home. I said, I flew back to the house. I went, took, dropped the Chevy off, got it back in my car, drove back to the house, and I cleaned up everything from head to toe, top to bottom. This saved my life. This saved my life. Whether I knew it or not, that's what I was doing or why I was doing it, but these actions right here saved my life because it allowed me to get rid of everything and move everything and, and, and do what I had to do. So at that point, good evening, good evening, guys. Thank you for the comments. I'll get to them. Good evening, Jay. Thank you for joining. So at this time now, I'm stressed. I have no idea where it's coming from. I have no idea who who it is. I just know that I'm under investigation. I know that. So my my daughter's mom at the time. Her birthday was coming up. This is this is mid July, two thousand three, and I said, you know what? Book us a trip, man. Let's get out of here. Let's go to the Bahamas, right? We're gonna go to the Bahamas for the whole week. Let's just go and get out of here and go chill. And that's what we did. We went to the Bahamas. Now down in the Bahamas, I run across people. I mean, this is what I am. I'm a dope boy. I sell drugs, and I know that I'm in a crunch, and I need a I need to connect. So during this vacation, I'm still working. I go down in the Bahamas, you know, and I'm sitting at the bar and, and, and I meet somebody and, and we start talking and, and we connect. Right now, the vacation goes over. I come back. I have this connect in mind. Now, as soon as I land back, this connect and I were sitting here talking or whatnot, and I have to fly back down there. So as soon as I came back, I jumped on a charter plane and flew directly back down there and went and met with these people. And they showed me, drove me around. The whole time is a scam. It's a hustle. So again, in my ignorant self at the time, 
I'm down in a foreign in a foreign state around people in a place nobody knows where I'm at and I'm and I'm surrounded by drugs cartel and what these people were doing was really ultimately just taking my money that's all it was you know so they they set up a fictitious deal made it all look legit showed me the stuff showed me it was legit showed me the operation so that when I went back home, I would just wire them money. They do this all the time, I'm sure. They don't have to kill people. They don't have to do none of this stuff. They just set an illusion for you. And, all, and, 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 and it's a trap because now I felt like I was going to miss out. Right? I felt like I was going to miss out if I, didn't, if I didn't cut this deal because it all looks so, so good. So I come back now. I wire these people this money. I get this dude, another dude. Marlon involved, right? Now, with this guy, he was associate as well. And I didn't have the full funds to mail, to, to wire to these people. So him and I split it, right? Him and I split it. That night, Freddie comes to my house, right? I go in, I go home, I go to sleep. And Freddie comes to my house early in the morning with some with some drugs and when he comes to the house with the drugs right i didn't tell him about anything that happened i didn't tell him about anything that went on or or me getting pulled over or anything like that i didn't even tell him i went to the bahamas i just got back he came and talked about you know he ran across this and whatnot and and needed to um you know trying to make some money and and he saved this for me so i took it and i took it to uh one of my people's house and I dropped it off there and I told them, man, don't even worry about it. Just give me the money when you get it. And that was it. I went back home. By the time I got home, it was about four o'clock in the morning. At four o'clock in the morning, I walked into my apartment and my, my young stepson at the time, because my daughter wasn't, was not, um, not around yet. She was just actually conceived on that trip down to the Bahamas. So I go into the house and my stepson is, is asleep in my bed, in our bed with, with his mom. So I just go and sleep in his bed. And then I heard it. I sat right up. I knew exactly who it was. Everybody knows that knock, right? Sat up and I heard my daughter's mom come out into the hallway and she went to the door and she's asking who it is. And I hear it's, it's the police open up and I hear her saying to them, he's not here. Now, I know that she don't know that I'm home because I never woke her up or nothing. I went straight into the room. I'm not in the bed. She don't know. So she's telling them with conviction. So I'm just I'm just at this time I get from the bed and I go hide in the closet and I'm like until I can assess what's going on. I don't even know what's going on. I just know that these people are at my house. I just got back. Sure enough, she opens the door. They tell her that if she does not open the door, they're, that they're going to concuss the house. They know that I'm in here. And she opens the door and they come in. They start clearing the rooms. Now, when they start clearing the rooms, they finally come into the room that I'm in. They're, they're full scale, riot, DEA, federal agent, AR-15, laser lights, all of this full scale stuff. I knew that this was not our local sheriff department. So I just stuck my hands out and I came out. They come over, they snatch me, they put me up against the wall. And I'm telling them the story about the cop. I'm like, listen, man, this just happened two weeks ago, man. I just went through this. Blah, 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 blah. So they paused. And then they're like, well, do we have the right dude? Do we have the right dude? So then that's when the lead agent came in, right? Tim Lutz, federal agent. Tim Lutz walks into the room and he says, I am the one that was on the phone that day, Mr. Harold, and I am the one that let you go. So he said, furthermore, he says, you are the right guy. We got you. This is the federal agents, FBI, DEA, ATF. This is not your sheriff. He said, we got you. You're out of here. And they put me in the car. And from that point, they took me to a, to a middle school. Now, at this middle school, they turned this into this, this, 
this this whole showcase. They turned it into a, a glorious, glorious showcase for the press, for the mayor, for all the people to come see all the animals that they were cleaning up off their street. And they had cages set up in the common area of this school, four cages. And all of us were sitting in these cages, right? They were actual cages that were set up in the school. And we were, we were all in there. And while we're in there, the press is coming up to the cage and they're filming us and they're asking us questions. You got guys spitting on them. You got guys showing them the private parts, you know, just acting all tough, big and bad and such. And then the police would come and they would open the cage and take one out and take them to the back. And they'd be back for 45 minutes back there. So they were pulling us out one by one. So my mind, I'm just spinning. Me being me at that young age and not understanding what was going on inside my young brain, my head is just trying to figure things out. And within that, I'm going over everything that, thank you, I'm going over everything that is, that they could potentially hold against me. I'm, I've retraced all my phone calls, everything that I've said, because I was always so meticulous so so careful in everything that I did hence why nobody knew who I was they didn't know anything about me so I'm just going it wasn't much to go over but I'm just going over everything and it came down to one phone call now this phone call that I made with Mikey on one particular day was because I was lazy that's the bottom line I was lazy it was hot I was lazy and I was supposed to go see Mikey and pick something up and I was supposed to take him some cash that I had gotten some junk from him earlier, right? Because he had went down to Miami and got robbed down there for a lot of junk. But the sniffers liked it. Some stuff comes through, sniffers like, and but yet you can't cook it up. And that was his problem. So I took it from him, you know, at a discounted price, but he never gave me that price. So on the phone, this one particular day, I asked Mikey, Mikey, man, what's up, man? Because you remember that PR, man. You never gave me that PR. Let me know what that is. I'll bring that with me. And he shot, he shot the price. He said, man, just bring, bring 10 stacks. You know, we'll work with it from there. Cool. All right. As soon as I hung up the phone, I got sick to my stomach to the point that the, my mother's daughter came out and she said, Poppy, what's wrong? I said, man, I just said some of the dumbest shit I've ever said on, on, in my life on the phone. Like, I can't even believe it. I just knew it. And sitting in that cage, I knew it then. I knew this is what they got on me. This is what they got on me. So I started, I started playing my hand. I said, man, if they take me back here and they, they, um, they're going to have this recording. And I say, if they just hit the play button on that recording and it's this message this this phone call this is all they got this is all they got but now if they just go in there and just hit fast forward rewind or anything like that and just play randomly and it's some some serious stuff that i may not even then i'm in a world of trouble and sure enough kid you not when they finally call me back there you know you got this hollywood looking dude you know they're in their little silk shirts and all this stuff man you know plain clothes and they flip the chair around and they get in my face and you know we know about you we know all about you you thought you were slick and you thought you could get away but we know about you and the reason why we know about you is because the 15 people that would just came in here ahead of you told me all about you so i laugh i'm like man i'm 15 i don't even know them 15 people like i don't know anybody in here you know so i'm laughing and he's like, you think it's funny? He's like, okay. What do you know about this? Bomb, he hits play. And it is that recording. So I smile. You know, I'm cocky. Because at this time, I know that they really don't have anything on me. I know they don't have no control buys. I know they don't have no, no recordings of me. I just know that somebody's phone was tapped. I don't know whose it was. Could only be a couple people. There's only two or three people that I talked to. And sure enough, it was that phone call. So I smile. What are you talking about, man? That's t-shirts. 10 stacks of t-shirts. 
dude, you can go back and you can play back all the other phone calls. Me and this dude, we, we work merchandise, man. Those are t-shirts. He told me to bring 10 stacks of t-shirts. So he's like, oh, okay. You're a smart guy, huh? All right. He says, you know what? He says, listen, this is your last opportunity right here. He says, if you don't cooperate here, the boat's going to leave without you. And I told him, man, you know what? Sayonara. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. And they took me back to, to the little holding tank. All day process. We end up going to jail. Now, I haven't even been able to use the phone yet. I know that my father, who's, who's watching this now, who I've, doesn't even know any of this stuff, right? This is all revelation to them. But my father and my stepmother were just sitting at home getting preparing their dinner have no clue what my day has been none they sit down to eat dinner and then sure enough here goes the news six o'clock news and who do they have on the six o'clock news me of all people it's any revelation for for a parent to find to look up at the tv and seeing their child locked up unknowingly you know it's it's i can't even imagine the shock on their face or, or what they experienced at that time but i couldn't get to him i couldn't get to them i couldn't get to him to let them know listen they got me on some bullshit whatever you see on the tv nothing they helped me you know and that's just what it is so that was it i was arrested on five kilos or more of conspiracy, conspiracy to traffic five kilos or more of cocaine. I knew that I wasn't trafficking no five kilos, nor have I trafficked five kilos in this particular conspiracy. You'd have to take a lot of years and, and time and whatnot to round up five kilos worth of cocaine that I would have sold. And I know it wasn't in this conspiracy, and I know it wasn't from this individual that I've only operated with four times, right? So... Out of the gate, I'm going to trial. I'm going to trial. These people are not going to do this to me. They don't have nothing on me. I'm telling everybody else, we going to trial. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, we going to trial. <laughs> we going to trial too, man. Yeah, we with you. So that's what it was. Again, I'm the dummy. You know, I'm the dummy. I had my family, I had friends, I had everybody coming to me daily, constantly. Why are you going to trial? Why won't you cooperate with them? Everybody else cooperated. Why are you being the one person going to trial? This was a 40-man indictment. 40 of us. 40 kids. Right? 40 kids that they were trying to give life to. All of us, for the most part. This, this small town was trying to make an example of us because at the time this was the largest drug bust in that county's history this county never experienced nothing like this people got promotions they got all kinds of stuff man probably even got a hot cup of coffee out of it too salute so i'm going to trial i'm going to trial the ultimate factor for me in the face of all of what was going on and in all of what everybody was telling me to my face how foolish i was how i could just be out in time in no time freddie comes to my house one night now up until this point freddie's been one of the ones talking about man i'm going to trial with you they don't have nothing on us we're going to trial so he comes to my house one night he comes in and and uh Man, my nose is. Excuse me. So he comes in and uh, the, my, my daughter's mother makes him a plate of food, some chicken wings, some rice and beans. He sits down, eats some of the food. He's drunk. Right. So now as he's sitting across from me, three feet across from me, he comes up, he looks up at me. He's like, man, listen, I'm a plea out. So I'm going to take a plea. And he said, they want me to testify against you. And I told him I would. So I'm just coming here to let you know that I'm going to testify against you. Now, 
I know what most of y'all are saying, man. Oh, man, that dude couldn't have sit in my house and said that and all these things. True enough. That went through me, right? But what instantly came into me was fear. The fear that he was setting me up at this point. He was trying to get information out of me, um, maybe get me to retaliate against him. Maybe he thought that by him coming over saying uh, that he was going to go to trial, that I would attack him and it would show me as a violent criminal. And maybe this is, was their intent, was trying to slap some kind of violent charges on me as well. Because, of course, we all know violence is what really stacks up your time. I know these people wanted to get rid of me. They hated that I was going to trial. They, these, the feds threatened me all the time. Man, you go to trial, we're going to give you life. I'm telling you, we can do it. You sentencing guidelines, 10 to life. It says it right there. Go to trial. We're going to recommend life. This was in my face all the time. So Freddie's, you know, this is the first thing I'm thinking is this dude's tapped. This dude's wired. This guy is wired and I need to just chill. So I'm like, okay, cool, man. You know, <laughs> whatever. I said, Freddie, you, you've never, you've never been arrested in your life. They have you for one kilo of cocaine. How much time do you think you're going to do? Everything that we've been doing, all that we've been doing, you can't do no time. You trying to do no time. So he's like, man, I just can't do it. All right, cool. So I said, from this point on, partner, you know what it is from here, you know? And, uh, and that was it. He got up. He was crying. Got tears coming down his cheeks, you know? And he left. He left. I didn't see him no more. Not near another time until he took that stand against me. So another attempt to come at me was my daughter's aunt, my daughter's mother's sister. And she came to me and she's, she's begging me almost one day. She spent three hours begging me to try to, 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 cop, a, to, to cop out, not to go to trial. And to the point to where I asked her, like, are you getting something out of, if I go to, if I plea deal, if I take a plea, like, do you get something out of this? And she's like, yes, yes, honestly, yes. It helps me out too. If you, if I can get you to plea out, it helps me out. And it hit me. Everybody only cared about themselves. Everybody was only looking out for themselves. I had surrounded myself with leeches and parasites. Pernicious people who, who would just eat your heart out to save their own. There was no honor. There was no, there was no loyalty. I created all of this in my mind just to be accepted. It hit me in that moment. What a fool I was. What a stupid, stupid kid I was. To allow this to happen to me. Nobody understood. Nobody understood. What I was going through or my decisions. Nobody said, man, listen, you're doing the man thing. You know, whatever it is, whatever you decide, <clears throat> like you're, you're, you're accepting responsibility and you're doing your thing. You're fighting for your life and you have every right to do that. You know, you have every right to fight for your life. Nobody was telling me that. Everybody was telling me to cooperate. It sent my life in a, in a, in a, in a different direction. And at this point, all that did was just bolster me because now I felt like a champion. Now I felt like I'm, I'm the, the king of cowards. You know what I mean? I'm the king of cowards. These, these people look at y'all. Look at you guys and look at me. And this is the type of time that I transformed into. It altered me. It shifted me. And from that point on, I shut down completely to the world and I prepared to, to go to trial. We're going to get into the trial. We're going to get into these things. I ran a little over time, but before I leave, what I do want to read is what the judge told me at sentencing. When he got ready and prepared to sentence me, he told me something. Now, I read my little spiel and, and whatnot, but this is what 
Judge Meriday said to me in that courtroom that day. First of all, I want to say that my job is to adjudicate these cases. This one has taken a good bit of time. That's a matter of no consequence to me. That's what my time is here for. And I wouldn't want Mr. Harold or his family or anyone else to think that somebody was being punished by my hand because they took my time. That's just not so. I have people occasionally want to withdraw their pleas of guilty. And one of the factors that the Circuit of Appeals says is, well, does it waste time? And you know, I sort of find that, I guess, an interesting factor to know. But if somebody has a good basis to withdraw their plea, I'm not going to refuse to let them withdraw their plea because I've spent time on the case. Time has passed and witnesses are gone or the government's pre prejudice materially in some way. That's a different issue. But the fact that we got headed down the wrong road and some time got lost is just not the point. As I've told, and I may have told the jury in this case, the objective is to get it right, not necessarily to get it just quickly or just even efficiently, just get it right. Second, the only thing I know about these exchanges to which everyone has alluded that occurred where I suppose people are calling one another names or something was when I heard the testimony from the witness stand, then read it in the transcript again yesterday, the thrust of it is that I guess Mr. Harold may have said some bad things about Miss Marsh and Mr. Lutz, and that there are some reports that someone at the DEA may have called him a name. That's not the sort of stuff that affects someone, I would say, as an aside, just as personal thing, that you are deceiving yourself. Hold on. Yes. Just as a personal thing, that you are deceiving yourself, Mr. Harold, if you think you can call someone those kind of names and them not take it personally. It becomes personal. It's irrelevant to the sentencing. It's irrelevant. But you're making a distinction that persons aren't going to make. And then I said, well, I understood that. And that's why when I got back to my cell, and then the, the judge said, I understood you wrote an apology letter. I knew that I was wrong. I could see that she had taken it personal. The court. You know, my dad told me when I was a kid that there's a lot of things you can't take back. And I guess it's probably inappropriate for me to give you now the example that he gave me then. But he was clearly right. There are some things you can't take back. And there are some things you just ought to be man enough not to say. But I want to make the point since I've heard all of this, it makes no effect on my sentence as much as I disapprove of it. It's legally irrelevant, I guess, in this particular case. But he said it, though. He said all that. But it's irrelevant. And I'm not intending to initiate a debate here, but I find it troubling to say the least, Mr. Harold, that you, your sort of net impression of these proceedings is that you've been wronged. Even if everything you say is true, you've been wrong slightly at the margin, and it's wildly unbelievable that you don't get that. I don't want you, and I went to speak, and he said, you've had your chance. It's my time to talk. If everything you say is true, you've been just a little penalty visit upon you at the margin. And my advice to you would be to forget about that, because in the scheme of life, it's nothing. And you're using it in an incredible way that causes me to be concerned about your mental health. You're using it to disguise yourself from your own plain view of the reckless criminal behavior that you engaged in over a protracted period of time, knowing full well the consequences. You know they tell. The folks over at the Alcoholic Anonymous, I think, tell people that, well, you know, that drunk over there, he's not ready for rehab yet because he hasn't hit rock bottom. He hasn't just given up and said, yeah, I'm a useless, fill I'm a useless, filthy, wallowing drunk. But as soon as he says that, as soon as he's forced to admit that, as soon as every construct and defense that he can erect for himself has been crushed by his own stupidity, then he's ready for rehab. And I'm not sure that's strictly true, 
but they make a pretty good point that somebody needs to hit rock bottom. Get all their defenses destroyed and say, okay, now I have to take personal responsibility for my life, quit making excuses, quit pointing everywhere else, quit talking about what a rough time I had. <clears throat> Folks at AA would say, get it right with the Lord. Get some operating principles that make sense in life. Get my priorities in order with my wife, my child up at the top of the list, and being a cool dude down at the bottom of the list, and getting a good buzz at the bottom, bottom of the list, and being this neat dude, goofy slim that kind of amuses everybody and has a, got a little following. Let's get off that list because that's childish stuff and realize that you can only live one life. You can't live two. You can either be a good husband, which you weren't, or a good father, which you're not. You're not a good husband because you don't beat your wife. You're not a good father because you don't beat your child. One of the many ways, <clears throat> one of the many ways that you're a good father is that you recognize the importance of taking good care of what in my church, when I was a child, they taught the temple that the Lord has given you to house your soul and worrying that the health of your soul and the temple that fits in it the using that soul and that temple to cherish your wife and cherish your children. Cherish those that are near and dear to you and the exclusion at will this other junk. These might be some, some typos. I'm almost done. And until you can do that, you're not a good husband. You're not a good husband just because you give your wife a paycheck. And I believe you could ask every one of a long line of women that question and every one of them is going to give you that same answer. You're not a good husband because you take your kid to the Little League baseball game or something. That helps, and that's part of it. But you need to... I don't think that you understand for some reason, and it causes me to be concerned about you when I see some of your history, the, absurd, the absurdity of the statements that you made, some of them to the court. They struck me as not so much as a judge, but just as a person as absurd that you and your present condition with this history, given why we're here, are going to allude for illustrative purposes to the assassination of Dr. King or the noble intentions of president to liberate the Middle East. What in the world do you think is going on here? So, you know, I think I know you want to defend yourself against these statements that I'm making. And I'm not letting you do that. And I'm not going to let you do that. I think what you need to do is drop all that stuff. Just drop it like what it is. The worst bad habit that a human being can imagine and start over and face. Just tell yourself, man, if I've gotten myself where I am, I must be operating this with the wrong set of principles. See, everybody else hasn't done this. There's probably a bunch of examples right around here. People who started out with nothing and hard times and it's hard to come up with a nice polite term but got squashed, quashed along the way by one thing or another. And the question is not whether that happens but whether you measure up. So having said all that ugly stuff to you, you're still a relatively young man. You know you can get better. You can make something out of yourself. But to think that you can participate in this number of people in this community with the purpose of circulating this poison among people who are not its slaves and not run afoul of serious criminal laws of the United States, that's just not so. It's just not so. And it would be so if I sentenced you at three kilograms, you'd still, you'd still be in a world of hurt here for this. For this long-term course of action, you know a friend of mine used to say there are two types of people in this world, people with excuses and people with results. And what you need to do is stop making excuses for yourself and, and face the truth. You're too adult. You too have many responsibilities to be indulging in self-deception. Is there any reason that we should not proceed to sentence Ms. Marsh? Ms. Marsh is the, the federal prosecutor. No, sir. The, the court. We're at offense level 34 criminal history category 4 in the advisory guidelines as I have it. Is there any reason not to proceed the sentence? My attorney, there is none. The court. You know, Mr. Harold, notwithstanding all of this, you strike me 
as a reasonably bright fellow and a, pers a personable guy. Or personable when you're clean, straight, and sober. I don't know you otherwise. Now, meanwhile, I've been clean, straight, and sober through the whole trial. It's one of the odd things about uh, the Arline Schaefer drug organization that I noticed, it's not un uniformly true, but a lot of these drug organizations, most of the people that you don't see impress you as amicable people and who had a lot of good options. But I know you're not very high on, on Mr. Arlene right now, and he strikes me as a personable young man, nice looking, well able to speak, looks like he had options, and I'm startled to see him where he is with his record. I'm startled to see you here. I guess I shouldn't name names, but there were other people in this organization that I was startled that they were here under the circumstances that they were. And I think that they had other options. I just think many of them still do. But anyways, as I've said to several other people in this, I'm not at the liberty to exonerate you from the consequences of your behavior, and I would not be inclined to do so if I was. Miss Marsh makes a fairly strong case that you should be sentenced a little more strengthenly. And Mr. Huffman makes a case that you should be sentenced less stringently. The word on the street is that a district judge now has sentence, can now sentence wherever and however she thinks it's right. There are two ways to look at that. One, that that's not accurate, that we're still heavily influenced by the sentencing guidelines, influenced by, by the sentencing guidelines that we should have articulably reasons arising from considerations including 3553 of Title 18 before we step away from those. The other, I guess, way to look at it is that there are just an equal factor, no more, no less than what's in 3553. To the extent that they may differ in any way from what's in 3553, I'm not as convinced that they do, that they, we can say, oh yes, I considered that. So while I recognize that I have the authority in this case that presents a persuasive and strong reason to sentence outside the confines of the sentencing guidelines, I see no factor in this case to do so. So my conclusion in that is expressed in 3553 and in pursuant to Sentencing Reform Act of 1984 to the extent applicable after United States versus Booker, Thomas Harold had committed to the Bureau of Prisons to be in prison for 210 months. Now, those were some atrocious things that, that this man has said about me. However, some of them were true. The many times that I went and read over that, many, many times, right? I, I knew that I was dealing with corruption. Corruption. <clears throat> and that is why I am indulging in outlying this case, because the whole case was corrupt and I was caught in the middle of it. I was an easy target of a menace kid to be swept off the street from a community that did not want this problem and did not know how to deal with it. And the feds brought it in. The feds came in to do a, just a wide sweep and get everybody off the street that they could. They wiped out a whole generation of kids. And, and a lot of these kids remained to stay out there to cooperate. And, and they're, you know, everybody's life turned a different direction. The things that this judge said, what, what struck me the most and resonated with me the most was I was a person that was making excuses. Right? I was making excuses. Those are facts. But... That does not change who you are, Stephen Meriday, or the prosecutor, or the agent. It does not change who you are, and you're absolutely correct, because I did become that man, and I am that man now, and I am exposing what has happened in my case, and what I went through, and what I was forced to go through because you told me to forget about it. The little minute stuff, well, that was a big difference. But that little minute stuff that you said was just within the margin that I was still a criminal, so it didn't matter if the legalities wasn't all there, but you're still a criminal, and the fact that you don't understand that, well, I question your mental health. You're right about that. You're absolutely correct. 
but you guys used me you used my life and you did not see my life as redeemable you saw my life as taxable and that's what you did and this is what i found out and this is why i have my passion so thank you for joining joining in um i will be going through this i'll be going through trial testimony this is all public record my case is public it's been publicized it's all public record so i will be going through it i'll be walking through it i'll be giving you the testimony of my friends against me and we're going to outlaw a federal trial because whether you know it or not cameras are allowed in state trial they're not allowed in federal trial this is where we get the little paintings of people because federal trials are closed circuit they're closed to the public why these are questions to be asked so until next time thank you for tuning in saturday night cell block this is thomas freemy please check out my website comminghomecoalition.com please make sure to mash the like subscribe share let people know and I will see you next Thursday. I'll probably see you in between little, you know, I've been streaming court cases or whatnot, talking about them. But I will see you Thursday night. We get right. It's the Demetrius Knuckleseo. If you have not caught that, please catch that. Till then, y'all stay safe, stay blessed, stay healthy. And we out here.